sunny day here in Anchorage. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Thursday to be here with fellow nerds at City Nerd Night. Yay! <laughs> um, quick show of hands, who all here went to City Nerd Night um, last fall as part of Housing Action Week? Okay, just a handful. That's great. That means that we've got bright minds and fresh faces and low expectations. <laughs> um, so today we are kicking off the first of our 2024 City Nerd Night series. We're hoping to do these about quarterly. Um, and so this format is um, going to be a really... I think, fun way to explore various themes and pieces of what makes a city a city. Um, and so here in the municipality of Anchorage, um, City Nerd Night is going to have a very local focus. Um, but depending on the theme, we welcome Anchorage locals to pitch ideas related to the theme um, that can be anything from a hyper uh, local focus um, to looking big picture, cities nationally, internationally, etc. Um, so our... Uh, I'll call it a pilot. Our first City Nerd Night was all about housing, and it was a lot of fun. And so today we are very excited um, to be talking about the theme, money, money, money. Um, our uh, lineup tonight all in some way, shape, or form spend their free time thinking about money and public finance. And so today, um, what I would ask of each and every one of you is to um, participate, be an active listener, um, we're not here to argue. We're here to take in um, one of our neighbors' thoughts and feelings about public finance. And so we're here to learn. Um, we're here to laugh. We're here to have fun um, because this is a night of finance fun. Um, because this is a uh, the first of our series in this year, I do have a couple of elements that I'd like to point out for you because I'm curious to get your opinion on how they work. So um, the first is that new this um, round is that we are live streaming. So we have a really great team here. Casey's in the back. Hi, Casey. Yay. Um, running our production in AV, which is a huge um, help on my end, but is also new because we're engaging with people online. And this session will also be recorded. So if you loved something that you heard today, you can send your friends a link, and they'll geek out with you about it, um, and it'll be great. So new this year or uh, yeah, new this year, new today, live streaming. Um, the other new thing is that uh, after our seven locals go through their presentations, we'll open up for a little Q&A. And so at each of the chairs, you'll see a blue note card, you'll see some plans floating around. Um, go ahead, if there's ever a question that pops into your brain, go ahead and write it down and raise it, and one of our team members will come around and collect them. Um, we'll try to save time for maybe three or to five questions at the end of the night, um, and then also give you plenty of time to mix and mingle and chat um, amongst yourselves. So live stream, Q&A. Oh, and then last but certainly not least, I think this is going to be a lot of fun, we have for the first time a timer screen. Ooh. So in the fall, um, we prepped our nerds to have seven-minute presentations. We let them go up there, and by and large, they stuck to seven minutes, and... No one was the wiser if they went over. <laughs> um, but this go around, we will have the timing screen. And so um, I could envision maybe two ways of doing this. Um, the first way is that when seven minutes is out, they're done. They have to stop mid-sentence and walk away. Okay. The second option is that we give maybe like a 20-second buffer period to finish a thought and kind of close it all out. So those are our two options. Um, raise your hand if you are a fan of the strict cutoff. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's one. It's one. One day we'll do it and it'll be so much fun. Um, in that case, we'll go ahead and give a buffer time um, so that folks can have the chance to wrap up your thought. And so to our nerds, keep that in mind, right? You are able to see the timer screen here as you're walking through your slides. Um, but know that you'll have a little bit of a moment to wrap things up. It's still going to be really rapid fire. It moves really fast. It's a lot of fun. Um, all right. Well, then, in that case, um, I would like to welcome our very first nerd. I'm calling her a bonus nerd because she is, in addition to the seven locals that we have lined up, she's going to get us primed for a night of finance fun. Please give a warm welcome to Anna. Okay. Hey everyone, uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. 
Um, I'll just note that I have my emotional support notes up here, so if I look away, that's why. Um, and also, I am your opening act, so I do not do stand-up, but I hope I'm the least interesting thing that you hear this evening, so uh, let's get it started. Um, I should also say I am uh, co-chair co of our Budget and Finance Commission, or committee, sorry, on the assembly. I represent West Anchorage, and um, I am also a super nerd and have been that way since day one, so I am happy to be here. Um, okay, so budget 101, and this is timely because I will let everybody know uh, part one of setting our yearly budget happened in the fall. We're about to move into part two uh, this April, next month, so we'll get there. Um, Basically, why should you care about the municipal budget? Uh, well, it affects our daily lives. Uh, it affects uh, snow, snow removal. I don't think you need to say more about that. Our emergency services, um, things like our library, and of course, how we take care of all of our public facilities. So that's our roads, our parks, our buildings, all of those things. Um, so the budget is really the reflection of the values and the vision and the priorities that we have. Because like everybody else, we don't have unlimited money, so we have to figure out where to spend it, what is the most effective use of those funds, and really how do we keep our city running the way that we want it to. So what are the parts of the municipal budget? Um, and this is maybe similar for folks who work on the state level. Um, some of these terms will look familiar to you as well. We have our operating budget. So that's really the day-to-day -day operations of the city. That's all the departments, um, including you know, the assembly. We are not a department, but we are part of the operating budget. It also includes uh, police, fire, parks, libraries, um, all the staff that really you um, rely on to get that work done. And then also our utilities and enterprises. So that's solid waste services, um, our water and wastewater utility, our port. Um, all of those different things are really parts of the municipal budget. And again, operating is the stuff that happens every day. Uh, capital budget, um, that is really for uh, things like upgrades, um, you know, you're getting your road reconstructed or um, you need to build a new facility, whatever it is, that's all capital budget. Um, and so those are things that are not just... Um, not all uh, physical projects, they might also be things like buying public safety vehicles, um, but really kind of those one-time expenses. Um, if you think about building a house versus paying for your utilities and the operations of your house, that's really um, the two parts of the budget there. We also have a few uh, dedicated funds, and two of them that you may be familiar with are alcohol tax and our marijuana tax. Um, so until last year, only one of these was a dedicated fund, um, but last year voters uh, approved Proposition 14, which takes our marijuana tax money, which was just going into that general operating fund, and has now put it in to pay for things like child care and early education. Um, and then our alcohol tax goes toward uh, violence prevention, public safety, homelessness, and also uh, some to early education. So really, those are two kind of unique funds um, in our city that are paying for specific things that are outside of the regular operating budget, but of course, a lot of things that we rely on. How is the budget decided? I'm looking at the timer. Um, <laughs> uh, so in the fall, the mayor releases the proposed budget for the following year. Our fiscal year, um, really the, the, the year that we consider for our budget is uh, January to December. So it's a calendar year. So in October, uh, we, we uh, take up the budget that's been proposed. We uh, look at it through our work sessions. We do uh, public hearings on the budget. Not always the most popular thing at our, at our uh, public hearings, right, is we don't hear from a lot of people. Um, but when somebody wants something, they will, they will tell us. They will ask us to put it in there. And then in November, we vote on amendments to approve the budget. Um, so that's what happened last fall. And then what's coming up next month that I previewed, budget revisions. And so the important thing about that is not just that we make some additions in the first quarter. You know, you kind of see how your revenue is coming in. Maybe there's some adjustments to make. The big one is that we also set our property tax rates. So what you guys got in the mail, your green cards, that's your assessment, how much your home is worth, um, you know, from the city's perspective. What we're going to be setting is the, the rate that's multiplied by that assessment to figure out how much in property taxes you're going to pay. So that's why that really matters in April. Um, so how are we funded? Uh, for 2024, we have a $611 million operating budget, and the revenue comes from over half as property taxes. You can see there's a chart on the left with numbers you can't read. Um, we have 14% uh, in other taxes, 3.5% from the state and federal government. We'll go there in a minute. And then also permits, licenses, fines, investment income, you know, a lot of other stuff. But really, you'll see more than half is, is property tax at the local level. So people say, man, my property taxes are high. Uh, first, I'll say it depends on how much your house is worth. But second, I'll say um, it is true that we 
do pay a large proportion in property taxes to fund our local government, that 57%. However, when you look across at other cities, um, you'll see that we're actually toward the bottom. In fact, we're that, you'll see the red arrow there. We are down there. Um, and that isn't to say that we're not paying a lot, but it means that when you think about people living in other cities, they're actually paying a lot more, both in property tax and also in things like sales tax. Uh, there may even be local income tax, right? There's a different mix of taxes. And so that's really important to keep in mind. And then um, just to note too, why are we paid for so much by our property tax? Well, we've seen really a pulling back at the state level of our other uh, funding sources that we've historically had. So of course the 80s were a good time. I wasn't up here, but I know there's a lot of money flowing around. Um, it used to be that in 1982, we received about 42% of our general government revenue from the state. Um, and, and then of course that went down. Uh, it looks like it's, it paid for about 36% and it kept going down. And then let's look what happened after that. So we started in 1985, we were getting 141 million. And then I'll note uh, that's 412 million in today's dollars. So remember inflation, it's a real thing. It's a really big thing if you go back 40 years. Um, and then of course our revenue sharing went down. So it's gone down, uh, or I should say, sorry, that was to local governments, not just Anchorage, um, but still a huge proportion of our budget as well. So now we're looking at for all local governments, $30 million. Um, and of course that doesn't include our road projects, but that is money that used to go toward paying for things that we rely on every day that, that the state doesn't pay for anymore. Um, and I'll note that, that, that a lot of states do re allocate a fair amount of local uh, revenue for local governments, but uh, not, not so much from us. Um, so we're doing pretty good. Um, we, we balance our budget, of course. Uh, we had a lot of federal uh, money that we were able to pay for the, the COVID pandemic uh, relief. But I'll just note that when you start looking at inflation, our budget's about what it was 40 years ago. So if 40 years ago, adjusted for inflation, 614 million, 2024, 611 million. So really when people feel like that, when you hear things like, oh, the budget's going up, all those things, that is true. And it's also not true because, and, and you'll see here some of the mechanisms that keep that in place. And I see I'm at zero now, so I'll keep going. Um, but really, <laughs> but really um, the, the bottom line is when the state stepped back, we had to step in and our only option really was property tax. And that's the bottom line for how we fund our city. So what's next? Um, we have to have some pretty hard conversations, I think, about what kind of city we wanna pay for, um, what that looks like, and then what mix of taxes we should have, what mix of revenues we, should, we can support and what we should have. And so that's really where we wanna go long-term. And then I think there's some really good ideas that you'll hear today. So I will cede the floor and let others speak. Thank you very much. Give it up for Anna. Wow, way to get us started. And Anna's gonna hand the mic and the clicker off to our next nerd. Please welcome Matt. All right, here we go. Got to get the first slide, though. No? Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'm, I'm Senator Matt Clayman, and glad to be here tonight. We were on a little bit of a little bit of rest from the legislature this weekend for Easter. We, a lot of us got to come home early. And I'm here tonight to talk with you specifically about the base student allocation, one of the big discussions that's going on all the time in terms of, in terms of funding for public education. Um, it's interesting because in Alaska we have had three essential f formulas for coming up for, for paying student for, for public education. The first from 1962 to 1972, 70, we called it reliable receipts, uh, which had more to do with what money was coming in. From 1971 to 1988, we went to a a concept called instructional units, and then starting in 1998, we've gone, gone with the base student allocation. All three models really looked at the same things. They looked starting basic needs for each school district. We have actually quite a lot of school districts. Anchorage, of course, is the largest. Uh, next is, is coming up with a standardized basis for local contribution. Places like Anchorage can make a local contribution. Some of the smaller communities actually don't have a tax base and no means for a local contribution. And then the last is to equalize the funding amongst the different districts across the state, uh, recognizing their different ability to self-fund. So that's where we've been. In 1998, 
the changes that came in 1998 were started with a, a survey that was done statewide, organized by Governor Knowles and the Department of Education. And the highlight of that was they found 81% of the people responding thought that we should fund education on a per student basis, which is what led to legislation that passed in 1998, creating the base student allocation, which essentially funds education as a cost on the per student basis. So what happens is you take the base student allocation and you multiply that by what's called the adjusted average daily membership. Now, ad adjusted average daily membership is you, you start with the number of students and then you have factors to adjust that. For example, the number of special needs students which have a higher cost needs to be factored into that, as do some of the varying costs for school buildings and other things in different parts of Alaska. So they come up with an adjusted average daily membership. And, and that came with, up with a base student allocation in 1998. And that led to, to what has to happen for the base student allocation to increase. The legislature actually has to pass a bill that says how much we're going to increase the base student allocation, because it's not just something we do in the budget. And so what you see here is a chart that shows, starting in 1998, how the base student allocation has increased. And what you, what you actually see when you look at that is, for the first 10 years, the legislature was pretty good. They were increasing the budget pretty consistently most every year. Uh, they increased it but with six different pieces of legislation over the first, uh, first 10 years. And that gets even more impressive because it turns out in 2008, they, got, they decided the way to do it would be to have an increase for the next three years in one piece of legislation. So instead of each year in 2008, they did three years in one piece of legislation. For the next decade, they only increased it twice by legislative votes. And one of those was, again, in 2014, one of these deals in which they, they increased for three years in a row in, one, in a vote in one year. So that's how they were able to make increases between 20 between 2008 and 2018. But really, since that time, there really have been very few increases, and the increases have been very small. For example, we saw a $30 increase in 2022, which, in the scheme of things, doesn't really do much to keep up. And so the school districts are really struggling with keeping up with inflation. Of course, that's what you all have been hearing about in the public as well on the challenges. And so what you have on this slide, this actually shows the base student allocation and the red line is taking the 1998 numbers, which would pass in 198, which is fiscal year 99, and you can see how there was a period in the middle when the BSA was actually ahead of inflation, but in recent years that we've really lost lost connection with that, and and that's that's actually a reflection of the political challenge that we have. Uh, what I often say is that the the political capital you spend to increase the BSA means that that for the next two or three years, it's almost impossible to raise the BSA again. And so that means you're essentially not keeping up with inflation. And an example of the challenge legislatively is that right now, the, the numbers that are getting discussed in Juneau are, according to the school districts, an increase this year to keep up with inflation would be about $1,400. The compromise the legislature is talking about has been around 680. Strong public education advocates are saying, well, it's really the $1,400 figure. But the compromise we can reach is about 680. And the governor is saying all that we should be increasing it is $300. And so that is a reflection of the political capital that's needed to get through these things. And the real challenge, though, is that we, we really are not, haven't been increasing it. There was a le legislation that we passed in January. The governor vetoed it. And we couldn't override the veto. And then the legislation we passed this week that helps rural school districts with broadband didn't do anything about the base student allocation, so we'll continue to discuss that. Um, but that's the challenge. So one of the questions I then ask is, is what might be a, a better way to approach it? And interestingly enough, Anchorage has a model that may be very helpful, which is our tax cap. Because what the assembly does for, for the budget every year using the tax cap, they say, what was last year's budget? And then you adjust that based on inflation on a five-year average. So you, you increase it by that amount, the inflation amount, and you also make an adjustment on a five-year average of population. So if your population is going up, inflation is going up, that would suggest that would be what you need for your budget 
basis. And so that's, that's why actually you saw Anna's slide that showed that it actually looks like over the last 40 years, the amount of the Anchorage budget when you add in inflation has basically stayed the same. And, and that's a reflection. So the, the thinking might be that if you went to a model more based on the Anchorage tax cap for education funding, your proposal is you would start with what did we spend last year, figure out what is the inflation adjustment, that would be where you start your education funding next year and then start arguing about it on an annual basis. And then it's part of the budget discussion, but it's never part of this, can you get the legislative will to increase the base student allocation in statute? And then you still have to come up with the money to fund that in your budget. So that's, that's kind of the, the rough outline. And if I can get this slide in the right place. Um, and I see I'm out of time, so I've got 20 seconds. Anyway, so I've actually introduced legislation. It's Senate Bill 238. It would actually say we're going to stop using the base student allocation. And, and the goal of the legislation really is, really is to start the conversation. Is this really working for Anchorage? Is it working for Alaska? Is it working for our youth and their education? And should we be coming up with a model that's more grounded in in, re in realities of inflation and the cost of providing that, that level of education. And that's all the time I have, so I want to thank you all for having me. And who do I pass this off to? Matt, well done. Sharon's up next. The mic is on. Sharon, welcome. All right, and um, everyone, just go, go ahead and put a little bit of like the tax cap in the back of your brain. We'll come back to that. Just put it right back there. Um, Sharon, I'm going to reset your time. And I'm ready when you are. Is your mic green? Kind of yellowy. And pull it really close to your mouth, yeah. Really close to my mouth, okay. Yeah. So hi everybody, my name is Sharon and I'm here to talk about um, subsidies between municipal tax districts, fact versus fiction. And I tried to find a picture of myself when I was in the fifth grade or the sixth grade to show you what a true nerd I am, but I couldn't find it. So I looked up the origins of the word nerd, and there's a theory that the word nerd comes from Dr. Seuss. And here is uh, Dr. Seuss using the word nerd in one of his uh, early, early um, uh, pieces of uh, work. Um, and I have a couple of disclaimers. One is the views expressed tonight are my own personal views and do not reflect the views of any current or former employer. And all the information that I'm presenting tonight might be out of date or inaccurate, has not been audited. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a rookie here. So now um, if we look at these two maps, to me they look like uh, uh, an MRI of a triceratops who's got throat cancer, but it is actually a map of our wonderful city. And um, more, more importantly, it is a map of our tax districts. It's two maps. The one on the left is a 2010 map, and the one on the right is a more current map. And um, there's a couple takeaways from these maps. Number one, the tax districts can range from ginormous tax districts like number three, which is Spinard, to teeny tiny tax districts. And number two, they're not always contiguous. So number three, for instance, you can also see that it's down over by Potter's Marsh. And then uh, another tax district, uh, I think it's five or 15, um, it's 15, um, includes Fire Island and then over to um, Turnigan Arm. So um, a little bit kind of crazy. Um, and each ta tax district sets different tax rates. Some exclude fire and police, and so as a result, their tax rates tend to be a lot lower than tax districts that include a shopping cart full of services for the people living in their tax district. So as an example, um, the highest tax rates in 2023 were tax districts one and three, including Spinard, at 17.03 mils, but then they can drop from there, and a few of the districts um, can drop considerably. Um, so a question was raised recently, and the question was, um, are Anchorage Bowl taxpayers the sugar daddy of the rest of Anchorage taxpayers? And ladies, 
Um, I have, uh, some nerds can think on both sides of their brains. So I have a recommendation for the younger women in the group. And my recommendation to you is that your education, career, and money will never wake up one day and decide to leave you. But when I heard that comment, I thought to myself, sometimes I think our society is getting a little too woke. And, I, and I, I, I chafed at the word sugar daddy. So I actually, and I'm not making this up, I Googled the following question. And that is, is sugar daddy a misogynistic word? And it turns out Google tells you yes. So we're going to do a friendly amendment to that question and ask the question, are Anchorage Bowl taxpayers subsidizing other taxpayers. So I've actually done the research. I've done the work. And um, the, the, you know, some smaller subparts of the question are, does a higher mill rate in and of itself mean Anchorage Bull taxpayers subsidize other taxpayers? More, more specifically, does the complicated ARTSA, LURSA, and pass the hat system that supports our roads mean Anchorage Bowl taxpayers subsidize other taxpayers. And I calculated the figures for every homeowner in Anchorage, and I calculated it two ways, tax rates and gross dollars. And I removed churches, government properties, and I also removed commercial properties, and I, I kept raw land in the calculation. And I I, I lumped the tax districts into four main categories. Eagle River Chugiak. Is anybody here from Eagle River? Oh boy. Okay. Uh oh. Anchorage Bowl, Hillside, and Girdwood Turnigan Arm. And so here are the results. So hard to read, but over on the left are the calculated averages, and then over on the right are the calculated averages by dollars. And I'm realizing that the row on the bottom you can't see it, which is unfortunate because that's where the really interesting information is. Um, so I probably should have sent this to you in PDF format rather than live format. But I can tell you, um, and actually I have this hard copy too, but I can tell you that the results are that the calculated effective tax rates, which are different than the mill rates, are about the same for the hillside and the acreage bowl but if you look at the average dollars paid by homeowner, Anchorage Bowl is the lowest. So, and how can that be? Well, the reality is, and this is a tale of two homeowners, they're fictional taxpayers, we now have two ways for you to get an exemption. There's one called the res exemption or residential, and also senior or vet. So a taxpayer living in a modest home can pay zero tax, but a zillionaire living in a mega mansion has very little impact to his effective tax rate because those exemptions have very little impact to his taxable value. Um, and take a look over on the left at what has happened to the residential exemption over time. It has increased 275 percent from 2017 to 2024 in only seven years. So here I have one other observation, which is um, we use the word area-wide when we talk about taxes very loosely. So let's talk about libraries. Eagle River, and I think I saw folks over there in the corner, um, not to point anybody out, but Eagle River is supported by an 18,000 square foot library, and Girdwood also um, has a small library. The Anchorage Bowl taxpayers, you see that little Bermuda Triangle there? They are supported by three libraries located within five to seven miles from each other, and I have 16 seconds left Darn it. And um, their Mountain View Library opened in 2010, the same year Hillside's library closed. Hillside taxpayers are supported by a book locker. Uh, and same thing with transit. Hillside receives essentially no transit services, but they're taxed as area-wide. Um, Eagle Exit um, has a very interesting topic that we'll catch at another nerd night. Sharon, great teaser, looking forward to it. Um, great, well, Brandy. Oh, your sister's coming. Sure, we'll be able to wing jangle that around, that's okay. Um, okay, so then um, if not Sharon, or sorry, if not Brandy, then we'll go to Jason. 
Um, and Jason, we're going to have to skip ahead to your slides. Oh, nice. Yeah, you can just flip right through. This is a bit of a teaser for Brandy's presentation. <laughs> I'm trying to go fast so we don't get uh, Brandy's presentation. Um, you want to start the time? I don't want to. I don't want to make it seem unfair that I'm getting more or less. <clears throat> that is well, so kind of you. Okay, yeah. I'm ready when you are. Well, uh, again, thanks everyone for for being here. My name is Jason Bockenstedt, um, and um, I previous life uh, was the chief of staff uh, to uh, the previous um, uh, administration here in the municipal uh, municipality. Um, so I have a little bit of a background in some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight, um, uh, mainly around kind of uh, trying to figure out how do we uh, move forward and increase the amount of uh, renewable energy that our city um, has uh, to potentially reduce um, uh, the potentially huge increases that we're going to see in the coming years as a result of uh, less and less natural gas coming out of Cook Inlet. So, uh, before we get started, I just wanted to, uh, a couple of questions. Um, uh, just raise, raising your hands. Um, if there are projects, and I'm, this is not a trick question, I just am generally curious in a general matter. If somebody else, uh, you know, in, in this example, the federal government, was going to pay for 60 or 70 percent of a project, would that be something that this room would be generally supportive, supportive of in terms of seeing something like that move forward? Look, okay. well, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. So, um, and uh, and then uh, you know uh, the next question is who has in this room has a lot of concern about what potential uh, future electric costs are going to look like here if we have to start importing natural gas. Okay, so a lot more hands w immediately went up there um, than, than with the other ones. So really, you know, what, what I want to talk about are some of the uh, new uh, kind of tax incentives and tax credits that um, Congress passed as a result of the Inflation uh, Reduction Act a couple of years ago. And this, this piece of legislation, while it has many pieces and parts to it, um, it can probably be described as probably the single largest investment from a United States perspective in clean energy. And the, the two kind of pieces that I'm going to be talking about are the very large ones over here, the renewable energy uh, tax credits um, totaling over the next uh, 10 years about $140 billion or close to it. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about solar um, right now, but um, part of what these new tax credits allow for isn't just solar. It also allows for, for wind and also um, battery storage, which is going to be also be an important aspect as we build both solar and, and wind capacity. But uh, the, the key here is that for the first time in history as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, local governments, states, uh, tribal governments, Alaska Native corporations, nonprofits, Typically, those users that don't have um, any uh, federal tax taxes that they pay are now eligible for these direct tax credits. Um, so essentially, you know, as an individual homeowner, if you have put solar panels or something on your, your house, you have been allowed to essentially get a 30% you know, federal tax credit um, as a result of installing that. So, Essentially, what the Inflation Reduction Act does is it keeps that baseline credit of 30%. And then it has essentially two additional stackable credits that you can uh, put on. Uh, one of them is if you're considered by the IRS and the Department of Treasury as an energy community. And as you can see from this map, pretty much the entire state of Alaska is considered an energy community, except for this tiny little dot that is Anchorage and the Matsu Valley. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing right now. We qualify for one aspect of the two-pronged test that, it, that, you, that you have to meet to get that 10%. The other one is essentially 
uh, you have to have a higher uh, effective unemployment rate than the national average, and they will calculate that every single year. So over the next couple of years, we could essentially be able to qualify um, for that. The second is if you uh, meet certain, if you, the, the equipment that you get meet certain uh, domestic, uh, you know, if it's built here in the United States, if it uses U.S. steel, things like that. But here's the, the other piece that is, is certainly uh, much larger. So the other two, the first two that I just talked about, you can take both of those. So you could stack, if you qualify for both of them, you automatically are at 50%. Now for these, these are your low income community bonus credit. You can only pick one of these. So you can, if you're located in a low income community and looking at this map, this is the map of what uh, is considered our low income communities. The ones in green are considered our low income communities. So if there's any investment from the municipality in these green areas, and that's the one you wanted to take, you automatically get 10%. I'm gonna skip down to the, the bottom one, the 20% bonus for a qualified low income, um, because I think that is where uh, there is a lot of uh, potential from the municipality's perspective to invest in. You know, I think as, as people have maybe seen um, with Chugach Electric right now, they're in the process of trying to figure out, you know, some community solar farms and having people buy into those. Well, we can, we can do that under here and automatically get a 20% bonus. So, as I was saying, with, you know, 70% of our investment paid for, if you stack the 30%, you get the two others over the course of the next couple of years and this 20%, our future investment in solar or wind or battery storage can be completely paid for by the federal government. Now I know that you know, a lot of times there's conversations about, well, we're, you know, who's, somebody's paying for this uh, you know, and we don't necessarily like that. Well, that debate's kind of already over. This program's here. It's going to be there. If we don't take you know, uh, uh, advantage of it, lower 48 communities are gonna take advantage of it and we're just gonna continue to, to lose out on that. And finally, um, you know, as part of kind of thinking about this, uh, thinking about this and doing this is already the adopted plan of the municipality as a result of the climate action plan that was passed by uh, the assembly back in, back in 2019. But again, I think it, uh, as, as I'll end, the, the, the interesting aspect of this is I think it does open up the opportunity for a lot of partnerships with organizations that historically, you know, we haven't been able to work with. And again, just talking about nonprofits, maybe the state of Alaska wants to join, uh, you know, the municipality in Anchorage in, in investing in a large uh, solar project to uh, reduce the overall impact of the surge in natural gas. And the final thing that I will say, and I think I'm probably gonna be at 30 seconds, not 20, is um, that if you just look uh, and go to the website uh, of the uh, Fire Island Wind Project, um, that project uh, produces about 17 megawatts um, of power, but on a yearly basis, it reduces the need for natural gas by 500 million cubic feet. So just think about that over the next 10 years, if we can double through investment the amount of energy that is produced, that's a billion dollars or a billion cubic feet of natural gas that we won't be using. So with that, I think Alex is next. Thank you. Alex is next. Welcome, Alex. Great job, Jason. Thank you. And I see folks writing down questions. Feel free to write your questions down. We've got a couple of staff here. Um, they'll take it if you go ahead and raise it. Thank you. Alex. Okay. Oh, I got to reset your timer. Boop, 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 boop. Okay. Greetings. So I'm Alex Livka, and so much of what you're going to hear, I had the great joy of working with Jason for many years, and so much of what I'm going to uh, communicate to you tonight was the great work of Marilyn Bonsoff, who is also with us. So thank you very much, Marilyn, for all your great work. I won't point her out in the crowd. Um, I was the CFO for many years at the city. Um, I currently chair the MOA Trust Board, which is... Uh, gives about $16 million worth of dividends a year to the city. Um, and I've been here since 1997. So you've heard about the tax cap, so I'm gonna tell you basically how Maryland calculates it. So, but the tax cap basically, um, its purpose, as you've seen Anna 
d deliver so eloquently was to keep th taxes fairly stable. And, and they basically have been for the last 40 odd years in terms of relatively how much we pay. Um, the thing about property taxes is property taxes have been around forever. And um, everybody's paid them, everybody has always paid them. Um, and there have been many efforts to uh, change the tax cap, which came in by a voter initiative 40 years ago. But it functionally today is about what it was 40 years ago. So how do you do it? As Anna said, you start with how much money you collected last year, and then you pull out all of the taxes um, that are, that, sorry, then you add in all the taxes that are in the base tax ca calculation. I won't run through all of these, but this gets you to a total of, in this case for 23, it was about $389 million. Then you um, take out of there things that we have already said we're going to pay for. So judgments, if the municipality has a legal judgment against it, have to pay it, nothing we can do about it. Debt service, you voted by approving the bonds that you would pay for debt service. So that doesn't go into the calculation. So that gets you to the tax base. And then, as you heard Matt talk about, this is adjusted for population and for inflation. So, you know, when population goes down, we can collect less taxes. When we have inflation, like we've had recently, uh, it gets adjusted for more taxes. And so that gives you the base um, for the tax cap, again, $343 million. So then what do you add back in? Well, you add back in new construction, because that has to get taxed. Anything that the voters have approved, and so this um, tax is authorized by voter approved ballot. That's basically what goes along with the bonds, and then you've got the debt service coming back in along with legal judgments. And now you've got the limit on all taxes that can be collected, $408 million. And then, so we pull back, because we're trying to get to property taxes, we pull back out all of these other taxes which are paid, which amount to $92 million. That gets you to the limit on property taxes. And then, so from there, 317 roughly million, we add back in this general government use, that relates to the fact that um, we also tax for the school district, and the school district runs on a different fiscal year, so there's always a little adjustment that runs into this. Um, and then, as Anna said, then you have to go through and figure out how much are we going to spend. And so then uh, this last step is where they determine, well, okay, we're going to set our budget, and thus we need to collect property taxes, and you can see here, for this year we collected, basically we taxed to the cap, is what that looks like. We've collected as much as we possibly can, and of course, why do you do that? Because next year rolls along, and you don't tax to the cap, you tax, you set for a tax rate that might be five million less, okay, now you're starting at a lower level for no real reason, because as you can see, these taxes have been fairly stable over 40 years, again, adjusted for inflation. So you heard a little bit about, you know, the LURSAs, the URSAs, all the different uh, areas. So they are outside the property tax cap because they have their own boards, they set their own rates, and so, then, so that gets you another 24 million. So the total that got collected in 23 for property taxes, 341 million. Um, where does it go? pays for general government, roughly half. The other part of it goes to pay for um, education. Um, and education is constrained. Mac talked a little bit about this. There's an equal funding requirement that basically says, you know, Anchorage has a lot of money. We could afford to put a lot of money toward our schools, but we're not allowed to because of this federal law. And then the wild card, it comes to school bond debt reimbursement. So historically, that's been... 100%. A couple of years ago, the state dropped that rate. And so your taxes went up solely for that one purpose, that instead of getting 100% of school bond debt reimbursement, we only got, I think, 30%. Um, and so we talked a little bit about, we saw this already, how that can differ. And so you can see, you know, that the mill rate in the city itself is different from the hillside, and that's basically just due to roads and drainage. And then again, Girdwood. Girdwood doesn't pay for fire or police, but they tax themselves for other things. 
So there are taxes that are outside the tax cap. We don't, you and I, don't really pay for those. So the bed tax is about $40 million. Obviously, that's paid for primarily by people who come visit us. And then I talked a little bit earlier, um, the dividend that the trust throws off, that's outside the tax cap. Um, the uh, taxes that Chugach pays, and these taxes that were used to be paid by MLNP, um, that's also outside the cap. And then alcohol and marijuana are also not included in the tax cap. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Well done. Um, and what a great reminder that we're here at King Street Brewing Company, where 5% of your alcohol sales go to the municipality. We have some handy-dandy coasters if you'd like to learn more about what specifically that money is going to, um, and would love to talk to you more about it. Um, but instead, we're going to keep moving on and welcome up, let me double check, Mike. Mike, come on up. Let's see if, see if this is on, it is. Nice, ready when you are. I, I obviously can't count up to six. Okay, so my name is Mike, Mike Edgington. Just take my glasses off. Um, there we go, from Nerdwood, Alaska, a small province in the uh, southeast corner of the municipality. Um, and I haven't gone backwards. Um, since we're talking about local government and money, I am contractually obliged to start off with a complaint. Uh, my complaint is that uh, whatever Anchorage is, it isn't a city. It's, um, I'll talk about this a bit later. It's a municipality, it's a borough, it may be other things. It's, there used, there's a city in the bowl maybe, but the whole municipality is a bit broader than that. Um, I was reminded recently there's a, there's a meme or a theme going around that um, men think about the uh, Roman Empire nearly every day. And uh, it occurred to me that in many of my daily conversations, I kind of do as well. Um, as those of you who recognize this movie from 45 years ago, um, you know, apart, except for sewer, except for water systems, except for libraries, et cetera, et cetera. What has the Muni ever done for us? So that's kind of my position a lot of days, and definitely many of my neighbors. Um, okay, so what is Anchorage? Well, it's a municipality. What's a municipality? Well, it's kind of a borough. Um, people say city. I would argue it absolutely isn't a city. Um, maybe it's a set of cities. It used to be. Um, really, it's kind of a collection of neighborhoods. Um, and this is a map I stole from uh, a realtor um, who had all the neighborhoods marked in Anchorage, Chugach, uh, Eagle River, and ignored the uh, Turnigan Arm community, so I added those. Um, but there's about 45 or so there. Um, now, thankfully, Sharon... Uh, Sharon stole some of my thunder and stole a couple of graphs, which is excellent because I don't have to cover those and I can talk about how we subsidize the rest of the municipality. Because um, I'm sure that's what it was going to be at the bottom of that other slide. So um, before I get to that, there's, there's kind of... So the, one of the questions is, there's all these different neighborhoods, different needs, different services. How do you fund them? And service areas are one way of doing that. In fact, there's two ways of doing it, really, uh, in code. Uh, one is this idea of assessment district. Really, that's about services for property. Um, so, that, there's a bit more detail here, but there's a special assessment paid. It's paid in proportion. It's paid um, proportionally from different uh, from different beneficiaries of the service. And in fact, when the service is originally created, voting is done as a proportion of the benefit as well. So it's not one person, one vote. Service area is much simpler. Um, is a property tax levy, basically one per one resident or one voter per vote. Um, to approve it. Um, yeah, one other slight tweak, which I did not know early on, but I discovered relatively recently, is um, I think assessment district, you can only do things which can't be done area-wide. Service areas, you can do things which are done area-wide, but do them to a higher level. So uh, that may be relevant in the future. Okay, there are lots of service areas, 71 in code, although thankfully a lot of them have been abolished. Um, we now have, uh, I think there are about 43 were active. Uh, this is just a split of the different types of service. Many, many are limited road service areas. So there's limited road service areas, rural so road service areas. The difference is limited road service areas can only pay for operations. Rural road service can pay for operations and capital. Um, there's different fire service areas, police, park rec. 
and then one at the very bottom, one consolidated. All of these service areas have basically one service, except for Girdwood, which has either six or seven, and hopefully somebody can answer at some point in the future why that, why that number is mysterious. Um, with all the different services and everything else, I'm going to just throw one of my favorite quotes from distant past. Oh, sorry. I'm going to do this. Um, so this is from uh, Charles de Gaulle, so another very topical thing. This is about from about 70 years ago, not 45 years ago, which is the early movie reference. How can you govern a country that has 246 types of cheese? We only have 43, we only have 43 different service areas. It should, should be much easier than that. Um, this map is very similar to, I don't have to go through this because uh, Sharon's already gone through this, or Sharon's already gone through this, except I noticed she only showed the one on the left. She didn't show, she didn't show all the other service areas which exist in the municipality. <laughs> Right, just a little bit more quickly. Uh, Good Valley Service Area, we have either six or seven. Um, there's this thing called Solid Waste Services, which is mentioned in the code. I have no idea what that is. Uh, I really hope somebody maybe in the audience knows why we have that. We do do police service. In fact, we used to do three, which is Parks and Rec, Roads and Drainage, and um, Fire Service. And then we've been on a bit of a tear the last decade. We added Cemetery Service in 2015. That may go away if, um, if area-wide cemetery is, uh, passes in the bond. We added police service in 2016, so we do have police and fire, Alex. And uh, we added housing and economic stability service uh, last year, which is kind of a little experimental, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, we also have an elected board of supervisors, so, um, and this adds some complexity with uh, the way that interacts with community, uh, with, sorry, uh, with uh, community councils, which I might touch on if I have time, which I probably won't. Next, what works well? There's a really close connection to services. So people in our community have, you know, you can, you see people in the street who manage this stuff. Um, we also have a huge engagement. I put 15, 20, that's like the biggest meeting I've ever been to locally. But, um, you know, if you, if you look at 15, 20% of the population turning up to a local government meeting, that is like 40, 50,000 turning up to an assembly. <laughs> Which I know it seemed like that sometimes, but it generally isn't that high. Uh, we have local staff, they're very engaged again in the community. We can design services which are right-sized to our community. So, for example, we have a rural police model, uh, not, a, uh, not an urban police model, which works great for um, Girdwood, um, but obviously wouldn't work for uh, Anchorage. may work for other communities. Um, and the other thing which is kind of an interesting, um, interesting thing is our roads and drainage covers literally one watershed. There's often a criticism of some of the uh, lurses if they have drainage um, responsibilities as well, and they're kind of all next to each other, lots of small ones. Um, sometimes drainage becomes a problem. Now, as we have everything in the same watershed. I've got 25 seconds. Um, what doesn't work very well? Well, there's a whole bunch of political issues. Uh, we have, like, local elected people, but we're only advisory. Decisions are made by people who, in most cases, are not, have no elected link to the community. Um, having a very high engagement locally makes that so much worse as well. People feel engaged in the process. They turn up to meetings. They make their opinion known, and then... Occasionally, I'm going to look around the room at certain faces, occasionally this gets ignored at the, uh, at the higher levels of government. Um, Anchorage Bowl has a huge shadow. Sometimes people only show maps of Anchorage Bowl and forget the rest of the municipality or call it a city, things like that. Um, and then quickly, the uh, last thing, financial. Um, there is always a question about what happens to things which are not property taxes. How much do we contribute in terms of... Uh, um, alcohol tax, particularly short-term rental room tax, things like that. And the biggest thing we have a problem with is access to capital. Basically, in a small service area, you cannot bond. We can, in theory, but we need the approval of the whole of Anchorage, and we always get rejection from the whole of Anchorage. So I lied about the 20 seconds. I'm going to take four minutes. Um, so next steps, questions about financing. Maybe other revenue uh, sources could be tied to geography when there's a strong geographic need. Um, the MOA has all these capital reserves, which they'll often invest in other people's bonds in the lower 48, and then we generate, we ask for, we the issue bonds, which are invested from elsewhere. As a small service area, we're kind of excluded from that process, but there is this capital sitting in the Muni and uh, potentially being usable. I was gonna say something about the exit movement, but I'm not going to, I'm just gonna introduce the last terms of subsidiarity. This is in the, U this is used uh, in the European Union and the Catholic Church, which is odd bedfellows. Um, but it's this idea that all decisions should be made at the localest level possible, which is consistent with a good resolution. And then my last thing is where else? Consolidated service area kind of works for Girdwood, mostly. There are probably plenty of other communities. We have all those other neighborhoods. Maybe it can work for others. Maybe we should all, uh, 
we should all have that level of uh, local, local power, or at least local control. Okay, thank you. Mike, nice job. Thank you, thank you. Now we'll welcome Moir Moira, sorry about that. Come on up. And let's go ahead and get your reset. In addition to being a, a city politics nerd, I'm also a, a nerdy Catholic, and a reference to subsidiarity is exciting. That was awesome. Thanks for that. I don't know if people talk about that. Uh, my name is Moira. I'm going to go real fast, so buckle up. Um, and uh, I'm here to pitch something that I think is pretty bold, and I think that's because we need to start thinking bigger and bolder in Anchorage, and I'm just so tired of talking about property taxes. You want to go ahead and get me started? Who's running the show? Oh. All right, um, here are some stats that we already depressingly know. Uh, the United States is the only subsidized, the only industrialized country in the world that does not offer guaranteed paid parental leave. Only about 14% of people in the country actually qualify for paid parental leave. We know that when parents do have access to paid leave after the arrival of a new child, it's funded entirely, 100%, by their employer. We know the best caregiver for a newborn baby is hands down the baby's parents, and we know that the most vulnerable people in our communities, the ones who need the most support from us, are new moms and newborn babies. So. What do we do about this? Major, huge, national problem. Uh, but I believe this is an opportunity for us to think globally and act locally. Right now, the Family Medical Leave Act uh, guarantees that you can take 12 weeks of unpaid leave after the birth or adoption of a child without risking your job, but there are exceptions to that. I don't know if many of you know that that requirement only applies to employers who have 50 or more employees at that particular location, and many employers will actually deliberately keep their roster at 48 or 49 employees so that they don't have to comply with FMLA. As a new mom or dad, not only should you have the right to take that time off to spend with your child, to care for your spouse, or recover from the serious medical ordeal that is pregnancy and childbirth without fear of losing your job, but you also shouldn't go broke doing it. So that's why I am proposing the Anchorage Family Fund. Oh, skipped something. The Anchorage Family Fund. It's a 1.5% payroll tax that will fully fund four months of paid family leave for new moms and dads, caregivers of a new child, if it is not the mom or the dad, and caregivers of seriously ill family members. So to be clear, this would be two caregivers of a given infant. For example, if only one parent is present, a grandparent might under circumst certain circumstances qualify for the other four months of paid leave. So some stipulations to clarify. This is only for people who are fully employed at the time of a qualifying event. If you are retired and you decide to step in as a primary caregiver for your grandchild, that is amazing, wonderful, thank you for doing that. You won't get paid for that. Um, you also have to be at least 18 years old and you must have worked at least 12 of the last 24 months and paid into the system. Does this sound familiar to anybody? That's because that's how the unemployment insurance system works. We already do this as a country and as a state and it turns out it's not that complicated. You pay into the system for your entire career. You hope that you never have to use it. That might not be the case with FMLA, but then a time comes and you need it and it's there for you. Some other important things here. The Anchorage Family Fund wouldn't cover 100% of your salary regardless of income. It would cover a maximum of $5,000 a month based on what your income is at the time of qualification. Similar, again, to unemployment. Uh, you, uh, uh, you, uh, <laughs> the amount that you qualify for would be on a sliding scale based on your income with that maximum benefit. So let's get to the numbers. How much would this cost? Do a little bit of back of the envelope map. math. In 2022, Anchorage experienced 3,578 total births. Should have a round of applause for that. That's amazing. If you account for the natural rate of twins and multiples, that is 3,467 birth events, I'll call them. Uh, and if two adults were to take the full allotment of paid parental leave, that's 6,934 adults qualifying there. Now, the maximum benefit here is going to be $5,000 a month. Let's assume that the median benefit will be $4,000 a month. That's probably high, but we'll be conservative here just for fun. If you take a four-month leave benefit, that's $16,000. And if everybody took it, it would be $110.9 million annually. But beyond birth, the Anchorage Family Fund should also be covering these other qualified events under FMLA. So the working age population is 189,000 in Anchorage. Let's assume 1% of the population each year needs to take time off to care for an ill family member on top of those that take time off for a new baby. That's about 2,000 people who would take advantage of the non-baby family medical leave component. Multiply that times the 16,000 median benefit over four months, though not everyone would take a full four months, and it's just a little more than $30 million annually. Together, this is $141 million in direct payments, but there are administrative costs. So let's think about what this is gonna cost 
cost to make happen. Uh, there is case management for 12,000 applicants each year, about 1,000 applicants a month, which will require four full-time case managers. And the accounting payments and processing of the program will require another four full-time employees at the Muni. Average salary and benefits for these employees is $120,000. And for technical, ex for technical software, other expenses like that, we assume about a million dollars a year. Total, it's $143 million annually to fund the Anchorage Family Fund. How do we pay for it? So total earned wages in 2023 was $9,750,000,000, a 1.5% payroll tax on all wages. And let's assume we tax everybody the same here, although this would make more sense if it's slightly graduated, would generate $146 million per year, about $3 million more than the program cost. Now, why would we do this? So other than the obvious moral imperative that we do better when it comes to taking care of moms and new babies, there are some other issues at play. Benefit, number one, attracting new people to Anchorage. We are bleeding talent. I don't think anybody here needs to be told that, but our businesses can't find people. We have two job vacancies for every job seeker, and anyone who has a choice is probably considering moving somewhere else right now, and anyone living elsewhere is not considering moving here. But what if you wanted to live in a mountain west city? What if you love to ski? What if you're actually from here and left, and all of a sudden Anchorage is the one city in America that guarantees four months of paid parental leave when you start having kids? This would be one of the most attractive features Anchorage could possibly add to make it a destination for young, talented people. And it also, by the way, moves the burden of paying for this benefit from businesses to the community as a whole. Two, we are living in the middle of the biggest childcare crisis in our history. Take it from me, I am a mom of two. We do not have a crisis of affordability, we have a crisis of availability, actually both. The biggest challenge in creating childcare availability is staffing infant rooms because the state requires that there be one certified childcare provider for every four infants in the room. This increases to a ratio of one to seven for three and four year olds and one to 10 for five and six year olds. So the more infants you have, the more staff you have. Now incidentally, have you ever wondered why the ratio for an infant classroom is one adult for every four babies? That is because it's been determined that that's how many babies an adult could carry out of a burning building. Take a look at that. Do you think you could do it? <laughs> what if you reduce the number of infants who needed daycare? What if almost all infants were cared for by a parent or another, one parent or another for the first eight months of their life? For some families, a combination of sick leave and unpaid leave might even extend this out to a year. So instead of sending your kid to daycare at six weeks, you send them at nine months or even 12 months. How many daycare providers? Oh, oh no, teaser. How many daycare providers would that free up? The same staff person who's caring for four infants now could be watching 10 preschoolers. Not to mention infant care costs are exorbitant because of the high ratio of teachers. Child care centers don't charge the full cost to parents of infant care because no one would be able to pay it. Instead, they use the tuition for toddler and preschool students to subsidize the rates for infants. And if you had fewer infants needing care, you could actually decrease prices across the board for everybody. Bonus benefit. Who pays for this program? Well, it's everybody who lives and works in Anchorage, of course, but also everyone who works in Anchorage but doesn't live here. So the 40,000 or so people who drive in every day from outside of Anchorage for a job located in the municipality. A payroll tax is one of the only ways to get this population to contribute to the city that they use every day, taking a toll on its infrastructure and creating large negative externalities like pollution and traffic. So. Let's make Anchorage more attractive for young workers. Let's help alleviate the childcare availability crisis. Let's take care of moms and babies. The Anchorage Family Fund. Thanks. Moira, you have me convinced. Amazing, thank you. Um, and so last but not least, Brandy, you ready, Freddie? Nice, come on up. So my name's Brandy and um, you know we can talk about property taxes and so forth but we need to find ways to create more excitement in our community and generate revenue through development and so my question really is is the municipality a good business partner um, and so when you talk about business you have to look at how it starts and it starts from the ground up someone has an idea they put it to paper they find a suitable location there are regulatory requirements and I just brought Here are some of the regulatory requirements that are all very, very subjective. 
Um, and then they have to look at the affordability, the holding cost, and then you get to administrative requirements within the business and the different frameworks that you have for your industries. So these things are like one big circular mess. And what I think Anchorage has done for the most part is really relied on big industry to come here and make changes. Oh, Costco's building this. Oh, this building's doing this and this person's doing that. But really what we're doing is we're neglecting what local talent can do. And um, the building we're standing in is a perfect example of neglect. Like this should be in a more generalized location and not in one of the only industrial sections of town, right? So they've got a really cool brewery here and it's beautiful with a stunning view, but they're taking space from someone who could create industry, right? I get probably half a dozen phone calls a week asking, if there are any warehouses for people to start their businesses in, if they can rent them at an affordable price, or even at this point, is there something I can buy to start up my business? And the answer is not really. Okay, so we're talking about community impact. What is the community impact of saying no to business? It's not just like, um, no, sorry, take your idea somewhere else, but it's also the money, the taxpaying money, and the resources that we put into getting that to that no, basically. So. For me, a couple of years ago, I called and I was working really hard to find a development opportunity for some people out of state and to come here in Alaska and do their project. And I had 17 ideas and all of them led to no, like in the first three phone calls. And so I asked the person who, the planner of the day, are you keeping track of how many no's you have? Like how many no's is it going to take to get to a yes? And the answer was no, we're not keeping track of that, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. <laughs> So I really believe that the municipality needs to invest in just keeping a log of the phone calls and the ideas that come in and where they go. How can we track that talent and those ideas, where they end up? Do they end up successful in Anchorage or do they move outside? And so that takes me to here, the lemons. I got this lemon, I love lemon. And this lemon represents an idea and I wanna make lemonade in Anchorage and make everyone happy in Anchorage. Or I can take my little lemon and hoard it to myself and just keep myself, my lemon to myself and my friends can come look at my lemon, right? So I come to Anchorage and I say, hey, I wanna make lemonade. And Anchorage says, mm -hmm. show us what your lemonade can do. How long can you stretch your lemonade before you can actually squeeze it? You know, or I take it to the Kenai Peninsula and they're like, hey, by the way, we've got the container and the sugar, let's make your lemonade. Or you go to the Matsu Valley and they're just like, squeeze that lemon all over. We don't care what you do, we'll clean it up when you're done, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But they do, I mean, you buy a piece of dirt in the valley or on the peninsula, we just finished a replat in Kenai and we're digging tomorrow. Like, that's amazing. Okay, so public sector perspective. You gotta keep things organized, you have to keep them tidy, but there's so many sections of um, regulation and different segments, like you have to go to the community council with your idea, then you have to go to Halo with your idea, and you have to listen to them tell you it's not a good idea because it wasn't their idea. So then you go back to them and you say, well, what would your idea be? And can I make that idea happen? And then you have to go to the municipality's planning department and say, what do you think of this development services? Can I make this happen? And then they go through this very subjective book of maybe you can, maybe you can't, but we'll get back to you in six months. And by the way, you're gonna pay us a bunch of fees to get there. And oh, since you don't really understand the process or you don't have time to do it, because this isn't what you do full time, you're just trying to come up with an idea, you need to hire someone to do it for you. And then they'll come here and then we'll tell them maybe, maybe not. So what ends up happening is you go through this and the whole time you've got carrying costs. You go through this really messy cycle of can I do this, can I not? And then you get to a point where you're like, no, I'm done, right? And when you say you're done, this is what happens. And it's like Moira said, the skilled and capable leave. And I'm, so as a real estate broker, I see this happen every day. People who grew up in our community, born and raised, whatnot, or have a talent or skill that's unique and special, they can take that anywhere in the States and live a far better lifestyle for less than what they're paying to live here, and that's not a good place for Anchorage to be. All right, and this is what happens when you don't invest in people in your community and small business. Okay, so property tax incentives, we can just pass that one because I'm running out of time. Transparency and accountability. I think this is really important. I don't know what all the ins and outs are, but I think that the municipality needs to invest in some type of um, 
software that allows someone to see where their idea is and the process. And all comment occurs through there so that you can see who's commenting and what's being said and how the work is being done versus waiting in this abyss of they have 30 days to give me a response. That's really hard for a business professor, for someone looking to start a business to live and operate in. Also, it'd be good to know who are the real stakeholders, like where there might be confidentiality or um, disclosure issues. So I just, I'm going to keep it positive, but um, I feel like sometimes you get a no because there's a conflict of interest that hasn't been disclosed. Okay, proposed solutions. Streamlining the process, reducing bureaucracy, enhancing transparency and accountability, and the takeaway, reducing is, oh yeah, okay, so here we go. <laughs> so. So we're doing this home initiative, which by the way is amazing. Thank you very much for everyone who's working on it. The problem is you can do all this stuff, but if you don't have services to support these homes and you don't have enough talent to build these homes or build more infrastructure, then it's all for naught, right? And so basically my pitch here is there should be with every, like there should be adequate B3 zoning, which is what this probably would fit better into. This would be really awesome just outside of your neighborhood. I think uh, Mike over here was telling me it was form like form zoning, so if it fits the form, then it belongs. Like if it fits in your neighborhood, it belongs. And I, was, I just had the great pleasure of visiting um, Boulder, Colorado to look at other similar mountainside communities and what they're doing um, for their community funding and infrastructure. And everywhere that we went, there was a, like a little community store in your neighborhood. And it was nice to just have that complete feel. You don't have to drive eight miles to cars on Huffman and stand in line for 45 minutes because they have one cashier. I'm not bitter. So um, back to what the muni needs to do to be a good business partner and landlord, because quite frankly, you don't actually own anything. You own a home sitting on a piece of land you're renting, because if you don't pay your taxes, they're going to yank that and the home away. So streamline the process. They need supportive resources, collaboration, transparency, and accountability. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Brandy. Very nice. One more round of applause for all of our nerds. Great. And now we're going to move into questions and answers. I do have some questions up here already, um, but any last call for questions? And then to our nerds, I'm going to ask that um, you pull your chairs, and I'm just going to have you like swing them around. Perfect. Um, and... Very good. Look at this stack of questions. I'm so excited about this. Um, and it's about 7.30, so we've got some time, and we'll just try to work through as many as we can. Some of these are for specific, some of these are for specific folks, um, but I welcome all of you to participate in um, answering the questions. How do you all feel about sharing a mic? Is that okay? Great. It's okay. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Alex. So um, maybe if we can jump all the way to the beginning, talking about the BSA. I've got three cards dedicated to the BSA. Um, so to start, Senator Clayman, you pitched um, a, a bill that you're currently working on um, for a new education um, model, funding model. Would the education tax cap model require a vote of the people? No. Short answer. Great. Could you tell us a little bit more about the process? It's essentially a structure for how the legislature approaches funding. And actually, the, the single thing we have to do every year is, is approve a budget. And so part of that budget would be education funding. And you would create a structure in which that was the, mod, the structure in which you would 
funded education, and then you would actually, if if you had that pattern somewhat similar to the tax cap, you would able to be able to say, did the legislature actually keep up with inflation? If not, why not? Or if we went above the inflation rate, why did we do that? But you would actually have, every year you would have a, 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 a gauge in which you could see how we were doing. And so instead of focusing on the base student allocation, did we raise it? And five years ago we raised it, and last year we raised it $30. You could look every, each year and every year and see how we were doing. So it would be a more consistent pattern. Great. Any other additions? Kind of a technical question, but very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I was choosing between these two questions. So this one has double sides. So I'm going to read it off as best as I can. Um, so as property values rise, it translates to a dollar for dollar reduction of state education funding via the required local contribution. We're all tracking this. If the BSA never rises as well, isn't this unconstitutional slash, i.e. does not meet the adequacy standard? So, so the, the short answer is that the adequacy, adequacy standard, because it has never been litigated, we don't really know what it is. The argument that that card makes, which is, I would say is a good argument and may or may not lead to a lawsuit one day, is where is the point at which if the state is not providing education on a statewide basis to a certain level, could the courts come in and say, no, you really have to spend money on education and you can't, can't divert that money to other things within the state budget? And, and so those are that, but the question identifies the fundamental problem that if the state isn't keeping up with inflation, then either education is suffering or cities are having to pick up the difference. And, and then, of course, when you add that on a statewide basis, cities like Anchorage can pick up the difference, but you go into a lot of small, small communities, White Mountain, for example, there's no means to, take, to pick up the difference. Mm, yes, thank you. Um, final question about the BSA. Um, so to your slides, can you give the number of students per year and the number of special needs per year students as two additional columns if you know this information? I don't know it on the top of my head. It's the sort of information I can request and find out, but it, it doesn't come quickly. That's great. One more reason for y'all to subscribe to our email mailing list. We've got a couple of table cards with a QR code. You can go ahead and subscribe. Um, we'll send out a follow-up and um, would love to maybe share that answer. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so now transitioning to another um, very clever idea pitched by Jason talking about investing in um, sustainable energy sources. So you mentioned um, that there is, um, Chugach Electric is organizing a community solar project. Could you tell us a little bit more about that to the extent that you know, um, and what neighborhoods are organizing the, the community solar and how folks um, can get in contact or learn more? I, I don't know a ton about uh, what Chugach Electric is, is, is doing. I, I know that they are currently um, before the Regulatory Commission of Alaska kind of talking about this, and there was a recent article in the in ADN that I could uh, send you, and you can send out if people didn't, didn't see that. Yes, very nerdy. I love it. Okay, great. Um, any other additions, exciting things happening for Chukach Electric? Okay, great. Onward. Um, so the next couple of questions, I think, are ones that um, folks can chime in on. Um, so the first is about the tax cap. And I think this is a very fascinating question. Does government cost less when people move away? Anyone want to take a first stab? Yes, very good. OK, so I have a little bit of family history here. Um, so back in the late 1960s, which is about when um, some of the numbers uh, that, that we originally saw here were up there, um, actually pre-tax cap, um, you know, we, we had a set city budget and we were doing city services for a, a much smaller city. Um, but the stats that we saw here were the population, I, I think it's the population in 1983 when the tax cap was passed, was 211,000 and it's now 283,000. But one of the things that that doesn't take into account is how much more spread out the city is um, than when the tax cap was first implemented or um, in, you know, the late 60s when we first unified as a city and borough and started to talk about uh, budgeting as the entire Anchorage Bowl plus Girdwood and um, all the way out to Eklutna. 
So you're actually talking about a land service area that is enormous. Um, you know, once upon a time, it basically ended at Northern Lights Boulevard. So I, I, I don't know the numbers here, but I would argue that the amount the government costs as the population decreases uh, it is very, th that decrease is definitely not proportional and it may not exist at all because you still have to plow those roads, right? You could have a cul-de-sac that formerly had 10 people on it and now it has one. You still have to plow that road. Uh, and same with schools, you know, oftentimes we, we, we think about, oh, declining school population, like, well, maybe that's cheaper. It's really not. You still have all of the infrastructure costs of running a school, of keeping it heated, uh, and, and those things don't go away as the population declines. So you end up with a Detroit situation, which is that you're your property taxes go down because you have fewer people owning property and paying into it, um, but then you can't fund essential services like what happened in Detroit was they no longer could let the police respond to pr reports of property crimes. Um, the, the police were so underfunded that they could respond to violent crimes only. If somebody broke into your house and they didn't actually hurt you, the police couldn't do anything about it. And that's what happens when you have this decreasing population and decreasing property taxes, you get decreasing services, um, but people still need those services over time. Wonderful. Others? Mr. Clayman, yes. I just, whenever we talk about that, one of the things that is actually one of the great parts about Anchorage is that our property taxes are budget-based and not value-based. And, and what ha the difference is, so here in Anchorage, you take the, the tax cap and then you take the property values and divide it into the tax cap and that gives you a mill rate. So, but what's interesting is the budget doesn't change. So for example, you still have to plow the roads. The budget stays the same. If your property value is dropped by half, and you think, well, my property value is down, I'll pay less taxes. But in fact, everybody, if everybody's property value drops, that gets divided into the amount of the budget, and you're, you actually will see the amount of taxes you pay will be roughly the same. And so in contrast, in 2009, we had major budget financial crash throughout the country. Other cities would have a 30 to 50 percent drop in property value, and because their property taxes were value-based rather than budget-based, those cities saw a 50 percent decline in their property taxes. Anchorage at the same time saw no decline in property tax revenue because it was budget-based and not value-based. And Sharon has a comment. And so I want to echo what the senator just said. If there's one family left in Anchorage, that family's property tax bill is $500 million. Mm. Sorry. Just a, just a small point. One thing we've heard um, when there have been discussions around housing is a shrinking population doesn't necessarily mean a shrinking number of properties. So uh, as, as family units, or at least the people living in a house, decreases, we can have an increasing number of properties, probably increasing property tax, but still a decreasing population. So there is kind of, they're not as linked as we think, perhaps. Mm. Anchorage is so geopolitical. That we have, su we have such a transient community that even if we do have a population decrease, there's still people that are having to move up here for lots of reasons. That said, why do we have to see a population decrease to get better accountability and more responsibility with the money that we have? I honestly, like, I have this much money to spend, and I have five children and a husband, right? And so I have to make it work. Why doesn't the municipality have to make it work? That's really the question. Any other thoughts? All right, great. Then let's start talking about the family fund. Um, let's start with, um, so this is a direct question from Moira. How do you envision the family fund tax to be paid by employee or employer? Could you talk a little bit about like that burden? Yeah, uh, that would be an employee tax. And um, uh, I know a little bit about the way that um, these accounting systems work. And it turns out that Payroll tax is one of the simpler ones to implement on an employer end. That's compared to, for example, a sales tax, where if you are involved in retail sales of any kind, the calculation is very complicated, um, and it usually requires you hiring an additional person or two in order to do your accounting um, at the end of the year. Um, a payroll tax would just be added on to the other things like FICA and state unemployment tax that you're already putting into those paychecks. So it would be in, paid by the employee um, some administrative uh, time required, probably pretty minimal administrative time required by the employer to make sure that that's getting paid appropriately. And um, could you tell us if you've considered any special provisions for stillbirth, abortion, other complications? I didn't. Um, kept this pretty general. Um, I, I have 
uh, known, sadly, a number of women who have experienced stillbirth, and because that is a serious medical trauma, um, that does qualify under FMLA right now. So um, you, you already get that 12 weeks of unpaid leave. The way I would envision this is, if it's an FMLA qualifying event, as a stillbirth is, uh, then you should qualify for that time to recover, to stay at home, to let your body heal. Thank you for that. So um, when are we bringing the Anchorage Family Fund to the ballot? You, you guys say the word. <laughs> Great. Well, you have me really energized about it. I'm a new mom, and um, that, that sounds just really amazing. And I also echo um, what you were saying about, you know, I think this conversation um, talking about population decline and whether or not that impacts um, the services that the city needs to provide. Um, and recognizing that we are a population on the decline, right? Um, so it's a, a, a really great contribution to this conversation. Thank you for, for bringing it. All right. Okay, let me see if I have a, any more. Do, 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 do. All right, any final questions from the audience? Yeah, so the question was, are the slides going to be available? And absolutely, in addition to um, this event today being live streamed and available um, to share out afterwards on YouTube, um, we will absolutely be sharing the slides as well as some follow-up information and resources um, to our audience here today. Uh, if you pre-registered for this event, then we have your information. Um, if you didn't pre-register, um, welcome. So excited to have you. And uh, would love for you to subscribe to our email newsletter so that you also receive that information as well. Yes. Oh, that's not a Moira question. That's a Matt question. I'll give a short answer, and then two people that were chief financial officers in the city can probably add. Uh, the likelihood, I think the hope would be, if you built more, more structures, that would actually increase those values. And I guess that would, at some level, lower some of the, the value, or overall lower the taxes for other properties. But I would... I would say would be unlikely to make a major difference. I, I think the answer is it depends because if you build more houses and then you pass a bond to build a school, it can go back and forth. So it's complicated. So the real technical answer is as uh, when there is new construction of any kind built that gets added to the tax cap, um, the amount of taxes that can be raised. Um, so it, it, I think as Matt said it best, it, it would change but so very little because you saw we add in any given year maybe, um, I think we, I'll lose track of maybe 50, we do 50 million in new construction, we've got $35 billion worth of uh, property value in Anchorage. So the difference would be modest. Thank you for that, great question. I think I saw one more and that could be our, okay, we'll have two more and then um, we'll wrap up. Um, I'm gonna give you this microphone and you can speak into it so that people online can hear. Um, and this might be a question that we want to skip, but I was just curious about giving Sharon two more minutes because I wasn't exactly sure what the takeaway was from all of that. Uh, so, but that's a proposal for you all to consider. So, so um, I love it. So I had uh, two slides that I wasn't able to share, and one of them was on Eagle Exit. Um, I think the Eagle River folks have left. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I don't know if people are aware of this, but um, Eagle River, some people in Eagle River desire to separate from the municipality of Anchorage. And um, they have um, communicated to the municipality um, several hundred questions. And the questions uh, have, have, if you read between the lines, um, the people who are um, desirous of um, a divorce um, seem to indicate a, a belief that uh, the divorce would include 
uh, a separation of some of the financial assets of the municipality of Anchorage. But, um, and remember the disclaimer at the beginning, um, I haven't yet done the math, but my initial reaction is that, um, and we talked about Hillside, we talked about Anchorage Bowl, uh, but we didn't talk much about what Eagle River residents have been paying in terms of uh, effective tax rate and gross dollars, but the initial uh, reaction is that they have not been paying enough into the system to justify pulling any equity out of the municipality of Anchorage's balance sheet if a divorce was ever um, consummated. That's one takeaway. And the second takeaway is that there's no subsidy um, uh, provided by the Anchorage Bowl taxpayers. Thank you for the opportunity to circle back and yeah, and finish the thought. That's great. One last could question. I, could I ask a follow-up to that? Oh, oh, a, a follow-up question. Yeah, I was just wondering, are there any areas that uh, are subsidized or any other areas that are subsidized or do subsidize? You may guess, ma'am. Well, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, the comment about the sugar daddy um, was um, focused on roads in particular. And um, so I actually had a slide where I took, um, I, I took my own home because um, I, I thought, well, well, you know, why not expose myself? And then what I did was I, <laughs> although none of you in this room know my last name because I was introduced as Sharon, right? So, um, uh, and then what I did was I went to... Um, uh, a tax district three, and I, I I scrolled down and I found the home with the um, effect, uh, the um, tax um, assessment that was essentially exactly like mine, and um, so my twin, right? And um, and I looked at um, how much that taxpayer was paying in roads, and then after pulling that out, how much they were paying left over for general government. And so what was super interesting was they were paying about twice as much in roads but they live on a paved road with sidewalks and streetlights, and I, and I live on a really yucky, dirty road full of potholes. So they're paying twice as much, but they're getting twice as much service. So is that a subsidy? I don't think so. They're getting more services for more money. But here's what's super interesting. We're paying $10 difference after that in general government, into, general, into the general government coffers, but they get libraries and I live on the hillside, I don't get library services, and they get transit. Uh, and, and because I live on the hillside, I don't get transit services. So it, it, the conclusion is that the people who are getting stiffed are the hillsiders. Mm, very interesting. <laughs> All right, yeah, there was one last question. Yes, I have a question about the family fund. It's such a brilliant idea. Um, I'm wondering what you anticipate the political process would be of actually getting this adopted, and are there any one currently on the assembly or perhaps mayoral candidates, uh, since we're in an election, who have indicated a willingness to, to pursue this and actually bring it to um, some kind of eventuality? Uh, you guys were my test audience. So I got to say, I uh, have not brought this to any of my friends on the assembly um, uh, or the mayoral candidates. Uh, I can think of one or two mayoral candidates who, who probably wouldn't support it. But um, I, I foresee a couple of challenges here. One is uh, constitutionality. So dedicated funds in the Alaska State Constitution is a really weird and wonky thing. Uh, I'm not an expert on it. And I really don't understand why we have this prohibition on dedicated funds. We've gotten around it with the alcohol tax and the marijuana tax. Others, I'm sure, know more about that. Um, this would, I think, have to be a ballot proposition. And I think the thing people would ask is, um, OK, well, what next? I mean, we have a lot of problems in this city. So how about a 1% payroll tax to help with homelessness? How about you know 3% to incentivize new housing development? It, it, it is one of those things where once you start talking about we're, we're going to boldly try to solve this problem, um, then we start having the conversation, which we should have, well, why, aren't, why don't we solve some of these other problems too? And I think that's why we're all here tonight is that we should be having those big, bold conversations. Um, but this would require you know, all of the uh, 
all of the processes to get it onto the ballot, and it may even be something that requires a 60% vote um, because it, it would be increasing the, um, it would be going above the tax cap. Uh, but that's a little bit outside of my, uh, my wheelhouse at that point. Matt, is it there G, uh, representative from West Anchorage, she's sponsoring something like this? Representative Armstrong is Armstrong sponsoring is a sponsoring almost the same thing. A paid parental leave policy for the state. For the state, yeah, okay. yeah for the state. So I want to clarify something. So actually, Anchorage does have um, paid parental leave for city employees. Um, it's four weeks, I believe, of paid parental leave. And there are some other cities, Austin, Texas, uh, and uh, one other um, that have done the same paid parental leave for city employees. Um, and doing paid parental leave for state employees is a good step. It's not the same as universal guaranteed paid parental leave for everybody, which is something I think would be a lot more attractive for bringing people here, because not everybody's coming to Alaska to work for the state or, or work for the muni. Um, but it's a good step. I'm gonna give a plug to our constitution. You should read the constitution. <laughs> I've read it five times. But more important than that, read the minutes associated with the formulation of the Constitution because it will tell you exactly what they were thinking and why they were thinking it. And it's pretty fascinating. I'm talking about the state constitution. The state constitution, yeah. I was like, oh, I didn't know they had minutes from 1776. Um, James but, Madison took those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, very cool. Wow. Any other um, thoughts on how a tax would would come to be all right great with that I will go ahead and um, close this out with some finishing remarks um, first of all let's give a round of our applause for our nerds this is great Thank you all so much for um, being a part of today's Nerd Night. Thank you all for joining us on such a lovely sunny wonderful spring evening um, I I'm just truly so grateful to be able to spend this time with you, to geek out with you about city stuff, and I hope that you enjoyed it. And so, um, as I mentioned at, at the top of our program, um, this is the first of what we hope to be a series over the course of the year of Nerd Nights focused on city things, municipality things. Um, and so, uh, would love to get your feedback specifically around um, you know things like the venue, the experience, even the layout. Um, as well as things like the live stream, the timing, et cetera. So if you had any ideas, come find me and I'd love to pick your brain. Um, with that, you will get an email from us uh, with all of these amazing resources. Um, and I hope that you have a wonderful evening. Thank you all. <laughs>